agriculture. It's the economic engine that drives this region. On this episode of Valley's Gold, we've traveled north to the rice country of California. From combine to culinary delights, we'll learn about the versatility of this grain. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, as we delve into this field of ag. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by The Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources, valley agriculture, and native wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our tables. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes. Brandt, professional agriculture. I've ended up near Knight's Landing in the Sutter Basin at Driver Farms. With me, I have Garrett and Greg Driver. Thanks for joining me, you two. Thank you. I'm here to learn about rice, and it's a crop I know nothing about, but Greg, let's begin with the family history. How long have you been uh, farming up here? In the, in the Sutter Basin, uh, two generations. Okay, but you've been a California farmer for many more generations than that. Yes, I'm actually a fifth generation farmer. Wow, so Garrett here would be, be the, the sixth, sixth generation. Wow, that's incredible. So I'm here to learn about rice, which again, I said I know nothing about. And so I guess probably the easiest part to start with is how do you plant it? How do you get it into the ground? And what's kind of the setup for the, you know, I know the fields look a little bit different than the traditional field I'm used to. Yeah, you'll find that I would go on the record as saying 80% of it's flown on. There are some people going back to the old fashioned way of drilling it. Uh, you'll find with your Japanese varieties, the drilling it is more acceptable because it tends to grow a better root base and doesn't lodge. Yeah. And you know, fall over on the ground for harvest time. But as a whole, you flood your field and then apply the seed and keep your water low so the wind doesn't hurt it. And, and when you say fly on, these are, these are airplanes that are actually, dusters. yeah, crop dusters that are flying yes. them on. And, and so when will that planting process take place? Uh, prime time, if I could plant all my rice on May, Fifth, I'd plant it all the same day, but you can't because yep. you have to spread it out, you know, so you can harvest it. But uh, I'm going to tell you between April 20th and May 25th, okay. most of the rice is planted in this area. Got it. So, okay, so you go through that process, and I, I assume it starts sprouting within a very, fairly short time period. And from that point, I mean, and that field's flooded. How long will that field stay flooded for? It'll be flooded for about 120 days. Uh, theoretically, you'll be in there to harvest it at 135 to 145 days. And Garrett, there's a reason why this land is so conducive to rice up here. I mean, we talk about you know flooding and water, but it's not necessarily a high water use crop per se. 
No, the uh, the acre foot on uh, rice, um, it you know varies on the area you're in, but you're probably looking at three to five acre foot of water uh, yeah. to produce the crop. But it's this uh, thick the, clay soil. The that... soil is what's the the really good benefit for being here, especially in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, the heavier clay soil actually protects it and builds a lining to keep the water from permeating back into the the soil itself or the groundwater. So. Uh, the water that you're seeing on the field is is really just a standing water source for the plant to take up the nutrients and, and to fight down the weed control. Uh, but then as that water is drained off, it's going downstream for other uses. It's not like it's just being permeated back into the, the soil or evaporating into the air. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you're able to uh, do a lot with that that singular water use. So, yep. And then as we, so we talk, as we go through the growing season, uh, you obviously, like a lot of different crops, have pest pressures, and it's not necessarily just limited to bugs, but also to the wheat side. Explain to me pest pressures of rice. I, in, in my case, I'd have to stick with the weeds as being the biggest problem, and there, there are insects that give you problems too. I mean, you have the rice water weevil, you have the army worm, and then you have shrimp. Uh, you know, when you first plant, they'll get in there and yeah. eat the seed. And, uh, when you start to progress through the season there, when does harvest time start to come around? I'm going to tell you the first part of September, well this year a little bit in August even, but normally normally I'll tell you we'll be going by September 15th next year. Okay. But uh, this year was a little earlier, but we, we had a very unusually dry spring and everybody was able to get things ready and we all got planted pretty early. Got it. So things came off a little earlier. But you went from a historical harvest season of being multiple months in the yes. fall and winter time now to just just about a month you said within yeah. a month to uh, six weeks you're pretty much done with harvest yes uh, i mean that doesn't mean that there isn't somebody that's still yeah. going yeah then but the, the the big part of the harvest is over by the middle of let's say november yeah. or october i mean and greg could you explain that combining prices to me what is that machine doing well it starts at the front with the header yeah and you need, need to cut it and feed it smoothly into the machine. And, that, and it really, truly starts at the header. If it's not feeding smooth, the inside of the machine can't run smooth. You, you know, if you're sending it in gobs. Yeah. So the headers that we use out here are what they call a draper platform. And it's the sickles cutting the grain, yeah. you know, the rice in this case, and laying it onto the draper. And then the draper brings it to the middle and then it gets fed up the feeder house into the thrashing part of the harvester, which is the cylinder and the rotor. Okay, okay. And then it blows the shaft out the back, and that's one thing that I was uh, impressed on is nothing in this field's going to waste, even though we saw what was standing and left and what was blown out, you'll come through and bail that for other purposes. Yeah, correct. So the, the, the climate and uh, the changing in the California rice production uh, has come a long way you know a lot of people think back to like the years when they'd burn off a, a rice field and the valley would be uh, settled full of smoke um, you don't see that uh, anymore you know it's really rare to see a field actually being burned um, and, and part of that is is the environmental component so a lot of people think about agriculture they think about the production the grain the crop that gets harvested uh, but uh, there's a lot of byproducts that come out of that process so uh, for rice, as uh, my dad had said, with the waddles and, and the use in the cattle feed is, is one of those aspects. Uh, the other component of it, too, is actual habitat, um, not only for waterfowl, but the native species and so forth in the Sacramento Valley. Well, Garrett and Greg, thank you so much. Again, I'm very informative. I'm actually headed off now to check out where you actually take your product to be dried and stored for some time. So thank you for sharing the California rice industry with me. All right, you're welcome. Appreciate it. I've headed down the street to Sutter Basin Growers Cooperative to learn about the drying and storage of rice. With me, I have General Manager Ray Davis. Ray, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. Well, let's begin with, tell me about Sutter Basin. Sutter Basin was founded in 1948. It's a cooperative. Back then, it started with eight growers to start the building of this plant. Now, we have over 100 members in, in the cooperative. Out of the 100 members, there's really only about 48 okay. that actually do the farming. Could you explain to me what exactly is a cooperative? Um, a member base only facility. Okay. So all the members bring their business here. 
They, they get their business done here and then they share in the profits of the business. So I just actually left the field to come here to learn about the drying process of rice. So where do we even begin? Where, I guess the first thing is you actually receive the product from the field. Yep. The, the, the product gets harvested in the field. It comes to this facility. The trucks pull up out here. We take a sample out of each, each uh, gondola out of a truck. Truck and, and, and that's that probe that's going down into the tank there. And we take a small sample out of that to determine the moisture of the rice coming into this facility. Okay. It gets weighed in. That truck, that farmer has a lot number, so that, that rice stays with that lot number, so we know that, that that's that farmer's rice. Yeah. Typically, the rice comes out of the field anywhere from 17 to 23 percent at okay. that time. Uh, from there, it goes into a what we call a pit. Uh, we dump the rice into a pit. It goes into a storage bin. From there, we take the rice and run it through these ambient air dryers. Okay. Our drying system is ran with propane. Most of them in the valley are ran by natural gas. Uh, at that point, we heat, heat the rice up to at least 120 ambient air degrees. But the, the grain temperature is right around 90, 95 degrees. Okay. And what you're typically trying to do is take the moisture from the inside of the kernel and push it to the outside of the kernel. Okay. That's how we remove the moisture. And we take that rice that comes in from 17 to 23%, try to dry it down to 16%, and then from there we throw it out in these big flat storages and store it there and run fans on them to actually bring the moisture down in, a, in three or four months. We'd like to get the moisture down to 13 and 14% 14% at that point. And at that point, we can store, store the rice in these big warehouses for up to nine months before it has to get shipped out wow. to get milled. So you can store it for quite, quite some time there. Yeah. And the way I understand that the way you're, you're actually pulling that air through the actual rice. So it's called the column dryer. So the rice, you, you fill these column dryers and it moves real slow through these screens okay. as it's working its way down. And it's probably going about this fast. Wow, okay. So it's, a, it's, it's relatively slow, but they're big column dryers. And one thing that uh, that's, was very fascinating to me was the fact that it's, when we talk about rice and you know, the differences between brown rice, white rice, and what the specialty of what California does with the different varieties we have here, mm -hmm. can you explain to me the milling process and what goes on there? Okay, the milling process is it's a small grain and it's actually got a husk on it, and we call it a hull. So when it goes to the milling process, the hull is taken off and what is left is a brown kernel. That's brown rice. Yeah. So if you go to the store and see on the shelf brown rice sitting there, yeah. that's, that's, that's where the process stops to get brown rice. Now to make it white, they take that same kernel and rub that little bran layer off to get to the inner, inner part of that, that kernel, and it makes it white. And that's what you see on the shelf. So the, the store, misconception is that it's different varieties. It's, it could be it, the same it's variety. The, it's but the it's, same rice. It's the same kernel, whether it's brown or white. That's and correct. so you go through, take that husk off, and then from there, it's ready to be shipped. Yep, so, yep. OK. And Ray, I know you guys use a lot of technology here, like a lot of ag enterprises. Explain some of that. Uh, the, the, the most technology that's came out is, uh, is everything being computer-based. We have um, technology that we have on every one of our drying storage buildings. Is, it's an automatic fan control system yeah. that actually turns on and turns off uh, based on uh, uh, moisture, temperature, and ambient air outside. Yeah. So once this is put into the, into the storage facilities, then we turn these machines on, and it's all computer-based, and they take care of maintaining that rice once it's in the flat facility. So that's probably the newest technology that's came out, but as far as the drying part of, of rice, it hasn't really changed over the years uh, to this point. Good, okay. You have a one big busy time of year, but you're really a year-round facility. That's, that's correct. We, our season starts typically the first uh, 10 days of September, okay. 
and typically goes to uh, the first week in November. And that can vary depending on the weather uh, variability that happens during, during the harvest season. Uh, but typically it's, it's right around eight, eight to nine weeks okay. for the harvest to be over. But we're open year round because we have to maintain and store the rice once it's in. So we bring a lot of rice in in a short period of time and then store it uh, for the mills whenever they decide that they want to come and get it and put yeah. it in a package and, and take it out to the stores. Yeah, and those mills are working 12 months out of the year. So yep. like I said, you got loads coming out of here yep. on a daily basis. Daily basis, that's well, correct. Well, great, Ray. Thank you so much. This is an industry I knew very little about and I learned a whole lot coming here today. So You're appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Thanks. I'm at Whole Foods in Fresno to learn what it takes to make some special rice dishes. With me is Casey of G Free Foodie. Casey, once again, we're together. I know, I love it. I just can't get enough Valley's Gold. <laughs> Today, we're in a unique setting. We're at Whole Foods to talk about rice. And specifically, there's some gorgeous sushi dishes in front of me. Why are we here? Absolutely. So we are in the Whole Foods classroom and the class that sells out the fastest here in Fresno is the sushi class. Wow. And the full-time sushi chefs teach the class. I am not a full-time sushi <laughs> chef, but I love sushi like you do. So let's show people how to get that kind of flavor at home if they're not ready for rolls. And so Casey, and, and before we jump into this sushi, what is sushi? I mean, because believe it or not, I still meet people that have never tried sushi. So what is it? So sushi is rice and fish. Got it. Prepared in uh, really simple ways. Yeah. Seaweed, and it's not even all raw. A lot of it is cooked. In fact, right. what we're making today is a cooked product. So awesome. this is a good California roll. We're doing deconstructed California roll salad. This is a gateway <laughs> to sushi. To getting, oh, that's awesome. I love that because I want people to just try this fabulous food that we have here. And like I said, we're going to be doing it with California products, which is the fun part of this whole thing. So. We are. So I've got some California grown sushi rice. Okay. So this is a short grain rice. And it looks much different than what I'm used to. But when you say short grain, it just looks shorter and plumper and just a little bit different looking. Right. Round, yep. short grains. And if this is available here at Whole Foods, number of other markets. But if you can't find this or you just want to do long grain rice, that's okay too. Got it. Okay. The difference when we cook sushi rice, and I have some here, what we do is you rinse the rice to make sure the water runs clear. Got it. So we want to rinse off any of the, the extra material, the extra starch that's on the rice. Okay. Then you cook it just the way that you do. Package directions, right? Yeah. You know. But I know there's. It's easy to overcook rice too, right? You really got to find that right balance. It is the great thing about sushi rice is you rinse it. It's two parts rice, three parts water. Okay. And you boil it, roughly simmer it about I don't know 10, 20 minutes somewhere in there till the rice absorbs the water, and then you leave it covered for 10 minutes so the rice can steam. Got it. And okay. then this is what you get. So you could stop here. But if we're gonna make real sushi flavors, what we're gonna do is dress the rice the way sushi chefs do. Okay, great, so, so what do you do? What we do is we turn on our burner here, and I have some rice vinegar. Okay, very little it looks like actually. Yeah, yeah. just a little bit, okay. about three tablespoons. Some sugar. Okay. You could also use brown rice syrup if you wanted to. So this looks like your, it's the raw sugar, right? That's raw sugar. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then a pinch of salt. So we're just going to let this marry together till the sugar dissolves. Okay, Ryan, this has dissolved and that's all we want. We're going to shut the burner off. Has that nice like amber look to it. Yeah. And we're going to pour that right over the rice. And you notice I'm not in a metal bowl and I don't have a metal spoon because now that we've cooked our vinegar dressing, we don't want cross-reactive. Okay, okay. So we're just gonna- Good tip, I didn't know that. We're just gonna toss that together and if we're doing it the right way, it takes a bit of the stickiness away and makes it 
more malleable, certainly, and also seasons it because it. you don't cook sushi rice with salt or any other flavoring. Got it. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, what's our next step? Okay. Should we make some salad? I think we should make some okay. salad. So I have some beautiful fresh crab here. One of my favorite things about the seafood department at Whole Foods is you can ask them to clean and crack your crab. While you shop. While you shop. And they will do it. So stop by the counter as you walk in and it will be ready by the time and you leave. And say, get that business ready. And they're <laughs> they're happy to do it. So I'm going to give you some of this gorgeous crab. Certainly crab rolls um, use crab stick most yep. often. Um, as we know, I am gluten-free. Yep. Most crab stick is not gluten-free. Okay. They make it with uh, white fish and flour. Oh, okay. And so we are using fresh crab. Fresh crab. I figured you'd be okay with that. I love crab. <laughs> okay. And I have, these are seaweed chips. Okay. I've just cut a few of them up to give us some seaweed flavor. And by the way, I love the seaweed. Seaweed is such as, I think it balances the flavors of, you know, this, the, the whole plate here, it's going to really balance it off. So. Absolutely. And then we're going to just put some cucumber. Got That's it. traditional California roll. I've got some sliced avocado here which is obviously one of the big components of the California roll is the having that avocado. How can it be California it, without it, it avocado, has to have that. right? I've got some chives here. And I have also some pickled ginger. Okay. Now you notice this isn't hot pink. This is bright yellow. Right? Yeah. Because ginger is actually yellow. <laughs> A lot of sushi restaurants and other restaurants buy ginger that has been dyed pink. So this is pickled ginger, Got straight it. up. And then I have just created a dressing with some sriracha, some mayonnaise, soy sauce, the same flavors that would be in a California roll. Absolutely. And then I'm gonna finish this, Ryan, with some black sesame seeds. Got it, okay. Just like a California roll. Yep, sprinkled on the top. All right. You ready for so that? That is it. That's gorgeous. And as you said, so simplistic. What do we have? Seven, eight different ingredients here. You just mm -hmm. you did the rice in a couple of minutes. I mean, so it's just a matter of throwing it all together and making it look in this beautiful, beautiful plate here. So So I'm gonna let you give that a taste. Absolutely. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say no to that. <laughs> Spectacular. All those same flavors, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So, My first time I've had a deconstructed sushi roll, and it is <laughs> fabulous. Love it. Uh, so this recipe will be on your website and Absolutely. on mine, gfreefoodie.com, and folks can come here to the Fresno Whole Foods and look for all their cooking classes, but particularly the sushi class. The sushi class, mm -hmm. but book early because it's the most popular class here the in Fresno. The most popular class. That's fabulous. Well, Casey, I tell you this every time. You have outdone yourself here. I came out here with big expectations. Sushi is my favorite food. And this deconstructed roll, I think, actually might be better than the rolls. Oh, don't tell the sushi <laughs> chefs. And you might put them out of a job. But <laughs> seriously, this is amazing. I am, like I said, so incredibly impressed. Thank you for sharing your incredible cooking talents. I can't wait till you have what in stores next time. I can't wait to come back. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Ryan. And I hope all of you will join me next time for more Valley's Gold. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by the Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources Valley Agriculture, and Native Wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. 
The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers. Gar Teutonian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our tables. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes, Brandt. Professional agriculture, 